Notes Towards a Critique of Maoism by Lauren Goldner. Um, note to the reader. The following was written at the request of a West Coast comrade after he attended the August 2012 Everything for Everyone conference in Seattle, at which many members of the soft Maoist Kasama current were present. It is a bare bones history of Maoism, which does not bring to bear a full left communist viewpoint, leaving out for the example, the sharp debates on possible alliances with the nationalist bourgeoisie in the colo colonial and semi-colonial world at the first three congresses of the Communist International. It was written primarily to provide a critical historical background on Maoism for a young generation of militants who might be just discovering it. That was the note. Now this is the actual article. Maoism was part of a broader movement in the 20th century of what might be called bourgeois revolutions with red flags, as in Vietnam or North Korea. To understand this, it is important to see that Maoism was one important result of the defeat of the world revolutionary wave in 30 countries, including China itself, which occurred in the years after World War I. The major defeat was in Germany, 1918 to 21, followed by the defeat of the Russian Revolution, 1921 and thereafter, culminating in Stalinism. Maoism is a variant of Stalinism. The first phase of this defeat where Mao and China are concerned took place in the years 1925 to 27, during which the small but very strategically located Chinese working class was increasingly radicalized in a wave of strikes. This defeat closed the 1917 to 27 cycle of post-World War I worker struggles, which included, in addition to Germany and Russia, mass strikes in Britain, workers' councils in Northern Italy, vast ferment and strikes in Spain, the rice riots in Japan, a general strike in Seattle, and many other confrontations. By 1925 to 27, Stalin controlled the Communist Third International. From the beginning of the 1920s, Russian advisors worked, worked closely with the nationalist Kuomintang, KMT, of the bourgeois revolutionary Sun Yat-sen, leader of the 1911 overthrow of the Manchu dynasty, and with the small but important Chinese Communist Party, CCP, founded in 1921. The Third International provided political and military aid to the KMT, which was taken over by Chiang Kai-shek, future dictator of Taiwan after 1945. The common turn in the early to mid-1920s viewed the KMT as a progressive anti-imperialist force. Many Chinese communists actually joined the KMT in these years, some secretly, some openly. Soviet foreign policy in the mid-1920s involved an internal faction fight between Stalin and Trotsky. Trotsky's policy, whatever its flaws, and there were many, was for world revolution as the only solution to the isolation of the Soviet Union. Stalin replied with the slogan, socialism in one country, an aberration unheard of until that time in the internationalist Marxist tradition. Stalin in this period was allied with the right opposition leader Nikolai Bukharin against Trotsky. Soviet and third international policy reflected this alliance in a right turn to strong support for bourgeois nationalism abroad. Chiang Kai-shek himself was an honorary member of the Third International Executive Board in this period. The Third International advocated strong support for Chiang's KMT in its campaign against the warlords closely allied with the land-owning gentry. It is important to understand that in these same years, Mao Zedong, who was not yet the central leader of the party, criticized this policy from the right, advocating an even closer alliance between the CCP and the KMT. In the spring of 1927, Chiang Kai-shek turned against the CCP and the radicalized working class, massacring 
thousands of workers and CCP militants in Shanghai and Canton. Now known in the West, now known in the West by its actual Chinese name, Gang Zhu, who had been completely disarmed by the Comintern's Com support for the KMT. This massacre ended the CCP's relationship with the Chinese working class and opened the way for Mao to rise to top leadership by the early 1930s. The next phase of the CCP was the so-called third period of the Comintern, which was launched in part in response to the debacle in China. In the Soviet Union, Stalin turned on the Bucharest right. There was in reality no one more reactionary than Stalin after having finished off the Trotskyist left. The third period, which lasted from 1928 to 1934, was a period of ultra-left adventurism around the world. In China, as well as in a number of other colonial and semi-colonial countries, the third period involved the slogan of Soviets everywhere. Not a bad slogan in itself, but its practical voluntarist implementation was a series of disastrous, isolated uprisings in China and Vietnam in 1930, which were totally out of sync with local conditions and which led to bloody defeats everywhere. It was in the recovery from these defeats that Mao became the top leader of the CCP and began the long march to Yan'an and remote northwestern China, which became a central Maoist myth and reoriented the CCP to the Chinese peasantry. A much more numerous social class, but not, in Marxist terms, a revolutionary class, though it could be an ally of the working class revolution, as in Russia during the 1917-21 to 21 Civil War. Japan had invaded Manchuria, northeast China, in 1931, and the CCP from then until the Japanese defeat at the end of World War II was involved in a three-way struggle with the KMT and the Japanese. After the third period, policy led to the triumph of Hitler in Germany, where the Communist Party had attacked the social fascist social democrats, not the Nazis, as the main enemy, and even worked with the Nazis against the social democrats in strikes. The Comintern in 1935 shifted its line again to the Popular Front, which meant alliances with bourgeois democratic forces against fascism. Throughout the colonial and semi-colonial world, the Communist parties completely dropped their previous anti-colonial struggle and threw themselves into support for the Western bourgeois democracies. In Vietnam and Algeria, for example, they supported the democratic French colonial power. In Spain, they uncritically supported the Republic in the Spanish Revolution and Civil War, during which they helped the Republic crush the anarchists who had 2 million members. The independent left PUM, Partido Obrero de <laughs> Unificación Marxista, a centrist party denounced at the time as Trotskyist and the Trotskyists themselves. These latter forces had taken over the factories in northeastern Spain and established agrarian communes in the countryside. The Republic and the Communists crushed them all and then lost the Civil War to Franco. In China, the Popular Front meant for the CCP supporting Chiang Kai-shek, who, it will be recalled, has had massacred thousands of workers eight years earlier against Japan. In, in the Yan'an refuge of the CCP in these years and through World War II, Mao consolidated his control over the party. His notorious hatchet man Kang Sheng helped him root out any opposition or potential rivals with slanderous rumors, show trials, and executions. One memorable case was that of Wang Shiwei. He was a committed communist and had translated parts of Marxist capital into Chinese. Mao and Kang set him up and put him through several show trials, breaking him and driving him out of the party. He was finally executed when the CCP left Yan'an in 1947 in the last phase of the civil war against Chiang Kai-shek. Mao's peasant army conquered all of China by 1949, 
the Chinese working class, which had been the party's base until 1927, played absolutely no role in this supposed socialist revolution. The one-time progressive nationalist Kuomintang was totally discredited as it became the part, party of the landed gentry, full of corruption, responsible for runaway inflation, and commanded by officers more interested in enriching themselves than fighting either the Japanese before 1945 or the CCP. The first phase of Mao's rule was from 1949 to 1957. He made no secret of the fact that the new regime was based on the bloc of four classes and was carrying out a bourgeois nationalist revolution. It was essentially the program of the bourgeois nationalist Sun Yat-sen from 25 years earlier. The corrupt landowning gentry was expropriated and eliminated. But it is important to remember that land to the peasants and the expropriation of the, of the pre-capitalist landholders are the bourgeois revolution, as they have been since the French Revolution of 1789. The regime for this reason was genuinely popular and many overseas Chinese who were not communists returned to help rebuild the country. Some progressive capitalists who were, who were retained to continue running their factories. After the chaos of the previous 30 years, the stabilization was a breath of fresh air. The People's Liberation Army also intervened in the Korean War to help Kim Il-sung fight the United States and the United Nations forces. But it, also, but it is also important not to lose sight of the fact that the Korean War was part of a war between the two Cold War blocs, and that what Kim implemented in North Korea after 1953 was another Stalinist bourgeois revolution with red flags, based on land to the peasants. North Korea went on to become the first proletarian hereditary monarchy, now in its third incarnation. We also have to see the Chinese revolution in international context. Stalinism and Maoism is, as mentioned earlier, a variant of Stalinism, emerged from World War II stronger than ever, having appropriated all of Eastern Europe, winning in China on its way to power in North Korea and Vietnam, and had huge prestige in struggles around the colonial and semi-colonial world, which was renamed the Third World as the Cold War divided the globe into two antagonistic blocs centered on the United States and the Soviet Union. There's no question that Mao and the CCP were somewhat independent of Stalin and the Soviet Union. They were their own type of Stalinists. They were also a million miles from the power of Soviets and workers' councils that had initially characterized the Russian and German revolutions, on which basis the common turn was originally founded in 1919. That is a thorny question that is too complex to be unraveled here. But from 1949 until the Sino-Soviet split in 1960, the Soviet Union sent thousands of technicians and advisors to China and trained thousands more Chinese cadre in Soviet universities and institutes, as had been the case since the 1920s. The model established in power in the 1950s was essentially the Soviet model, adapted to a country with an even more overwhelming peasant majority than was the case in Russia. World Stalinism was rocked in 1956 by a series of events. The Hungarian Revolution, in which the working class again established workers' councils before it was crushed by Russian intervention. The Polish October, in which a worker revolt brought to power a reformed Stalinist leadership. These uprisings were preceded by Khrushchev's speech to the 20th Congress of World Communist Parties, in which he revealed many of Stalin's crimes, including the massacre of between five to 10 million peasants during the collectivizations of the early 1930s. There were many crimes he did not mention since he was too implicated in them. And the purpose of his speech was to salvage the Stalinist bureaucracy while disavowing Stalin himself. This was the beginning of peaceful coexistence between the Soviet bloc and the West, but the revelations of Stalin's crimes and the workers' revolts in Eastern Europe following the 1953 worker uprising in East Germany were the beginning of the end of the Stalinist myth. 
bitterly disillusioned militants all over the world walked out of communist parties after finding out that they had devoted decades of their lives to a lie. Khrushchev's 1956 speech is often referred to by leader Maoists as the triumph of revisionism in the Soviet Union. The word revisionism is itself ideology run amok, since the main thing that was being revised was Stalinist terror, which the Maoists and Marxist-Leninists by implication consider to be the dictatorship of the proletariat. There were between 10 and 20 million people in forced labor camps in the Soviet Union in 1956, and presumably their release for those who survived years of slave labor, often at the Arctic Circle, was part of revisionism. For the Maoists, the Khrushchev speech is often also identified with the restoration of capitalism, showing how superficial their Marxism is, with the existence of capitalism being based not on any analysis of real social relations, but on the ideology of this or that leader. Khrushchev's speech was not well received by Mao and the leaders of the CCP, whose own regimented rule of China was becoming increasingly unpopular. Thus, the regime launched a new phase called the Hundred Flowers Campaign, in which the bourgeois intellectuals who had rallied to the regime, recoiling from the, from the brutality of the KMT, were invited to let a hundred flowers bloom and openly voice their criticisms. The outpouring of criticism was of such an unexpected volume that it was quickly shut down by Mao and the CCP, who began to characterize the Hundred Flowers campaign as letting the snakes out of their holes in order to smash them once and for all. Many critics were arrested and sent off to forced labor camps. Internationally, however, Maoism began to become an international tendency, becoming attractive to some people who had left the pro-Soviet communist parties after Khrushchev's speech. This was a hardcore ultra-Stalinist minority who felt, for example, that their own country's CP had not supported the Soviet invasion to crush the Hungarian revolution forcefully enough. By the early 1960s in the United States, Europe, and around the third world, these currents would become the Marxist-Leninist parties aligned with China against both the United States and Soviet social imperialism. In China itself, the regime needed to shift gears after the disaster of the Hundred Flowers period. There was growing tension at the top levels of the CCP between Mao and the more Soviet-influenced technocratic bureaucrats who, for, who were focused on building up heavy industry. This was the factional situation that led to the Cultural Revolution that erupted in 1965. Therefore, Mao launched the country in 1958 on the so-called Great Leap Forward, in which Soviet-style heavy industry was to be replaced by enlisting peasants and small industrial backyard production everywhere. The peasants were forced into the people's communes and set to work to catch up with the economic level of the capitalist West in 10 to 15 years. Everywhere, pots, pans, and utensils, as well as family heirlooms were melted down for backyard small kilns to produce steel at killing paces of work. The result was a huge drain of peasant labor away from raising crops, leading to famine by 1960-61, to 61, in which an estimated 10-20 to 20 million people starved to death. The debacle of the Great Leap Forward was also a terrible blow to Mao's standing with, within the CCP. It represented an extreme form of the kind of volunteerism at the expense of real material conditions, which had always characterized Mao's thinking as summed up in his famous line about painting portraits on the blank page of the people. Some Marxist. The Soviet-influenced technocrats around Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping basically kicked Mao upstairs into a symbolic figurehead, too important to purge outright, but stripped of all real power. Thus, the battle lines were drawn for what became a few years later the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was Mao's attempt at a comeback. It was a factional struggle at the top level of the CCP in which millions of university and high school students were mobilized everywhere to attack revisionism 
and return Mao to real power. But this factional struggle and the previous marginalization of Mao that lay behind it was hardly advertised as the real reason for the process in which tens of thousands of people were killed and millions of lives were wrecked. China was thrown into ideology run amok on a scale arguably even greater than under Stalin at the peak of his power. Millions of educated people suspected of revisionism or merely the victims of some personal feud, including technicians and scientists, were sent off to the countryside, rustification, to learn from the peasants, which in reality involved them in crushing forced labor in which many were worked to death. Politics was in command with party ideologues and not surgeons in charge of medical operations in Chinese hospitals with predictable consequences. Schools were closed for three years in the cities, though not in the countryside. 1960 to 69, or is it 66? It could be either 1960 or 1966. I don't know. To 69 though. While young people from universities and high schools ran around the country humiliating and sometimes killing people designated by the Maoist faction as a revisionist and a Lu Shaoqi capitalist rotor. Lu Shaoqi himself died of illness in prison. The economy was wrecked in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping, who also performed hard rural labor during these years, returned to power. Chinese agricultural production per capita was no higher than it had been in 1949. In such a situation where revisionist rule was to be replaced by people's power, things got out of hand with some currents who took Mao's slogan, it is right to rebel a bit too far, and began to question the whole nature of CCP rule since 1949. In these cases, as in the Shanghai Commune of early 1967, the People's Liberation Army, PLA, had to step in against an independent formation that included radicalized workers. The PLA was in fact one of the main winners of the Cultural Revolution for its role in stamping out currents that became a third force against both the capitalist rotors and the Maoists. During all this, Kang Sheng, the hatchet man of Yan'an, returned to power and helped vilify, oust, and sometimes execute Mao's factional opponents, as he had done the first time around. Perhaps the most interesting case of things going too far, along with the brief Shanghai Commune before the army marched in, was, was the Shang Wu Lian current in Mao's own Hunan province. There, workers and students who had gone through the whole process produced a series of documents that became famous throughout China, analyzing the country as being under the control of a new bureaucratic ruling class. While the Shangwulian militants disguised their viewpoints with blows to the thought of Mao Zedong and Marxism-Leninism, their texts were read throughout China and at the top levels of the party itself, where they were clearly recognized for what they were, a fundamental challenge to both factions in power. They were mercilessly crushed. Further interesting critiques to emerge from the years of the Cultural Revolution were those written by Yu Liu, Lu, fuck, Yu Luok, at the time an apprentice worker and later the manifesto of Wei Jing Shang, a 28-year-old electrician of the Beijing Zoo on the Democracy Wall in Beijing in 1978. Yu's text was, like Sheng Wu Lian's, diffused and read all over China. It was a critique of the Cultural Revolution's bloodline definition of class by family background and political right reliability, rather than by one's relationship to the means of production. Yu was executed for his troubles in 1970. The democracy wall, which was supposed to accompany Deng Xiaoping's return to power, also got out of hand and was suppressed in 1979. Mao's faction re-emerged triumphant by 1969. This included his wife, Jiang King, and three other co-factioneers who would be arrested and deposed as the Gang of Four. Shortly after Mao's death in 1976, shortly after Mao's death in 1976, this victory, it is often overlooked, coincided with the beginning of Mao's quiet outreach to the United States as a counterweight to the Soviet Union 
There was active but local combat between Chinese and Soviet forces along their mutual border in 1969, and as a result, Mao banned all transit of Soviet material support to North Vietnam and the Viet Cong, a ban which remained in effect until the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. Mao received U.S. President Nixon in Beijing in early 1972, while the United States was raining bombs on North Vietnam. This turn was hardly the first instance of a conservative foreign policy at the expense of movements and countries outside China. Already in 1965, the Chinese regime, based on its prestige as the center of Marxist-Leninist opposition to Soviet revision revisionism, after the Sino-Soviet split, had encouraged the powerful Indonesian Communist Party, PKI, into a close alliance with Indonesia's populist nationalist leader, Sukarno. It was an exact repeat of the CCP's alliance with Chiang Kai-shek in 1927, and it ended the same way, in a bloodbath in which 600,000 PKI members and sympathizers were killed in fall 1965 in a military coup, planned with the help of U.S. advisors and academics. Beijing said nothing about the massacre until 1967, when it complained that the Chinese embassy in Jakarta had been stoned during the events. In 1971, China also openly applauded the bloody suppression of the Trotskyist student movement in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. In the same year, it supported, together with the United States and against Soviet ally India, Pakistani dictator Yahya Khan, who oversaw massive repression in Bangladesh when that country, previously part of Pakistan, declared independence. In 1971, another bizarre turn in domestic policy also took place, echoing Mao's fascination with ancient dy dynastic court intrigue. Up to that point, Lin Bao had been openly designated as Mao's successor. The Maoist press abroad, as well as the French intelligentsia, which all the, all the time was decidedly pro-Maoist, trumpeted the same line. Suddenly, Lin Bao disappeared from public view, and in late 1971, it was learned that he too, supposedly Mao's closest confidant for years, had been a capitalist rotor and a deep cover KMT agent all along. According to the official story, Lin had commandeered a military plane and fled toward the Soviet border. The plane had crashed in Mongolia, killing him and all aboard. For months, Western Maoists denounced this account, published in the world press, as a pure bourgeois fabrication, including what Simon Lays characterized as the most important pro-Maoist daily newspaper in the West, the very high tone Le Monde from Paris, whose Beijing correspondent was a Maoist devotee. Then, when the Chinese government itself confirmed the story, the Western Maoists turned on a dime and howled with the wolves against Lin Bao. Simon Lees remarked that these fervent believers had transformed the old Chinese proverb, don't beat a dog after it has fallen into the water, into don't beat a dog until it has fallen into the water. This was merely the beginning of the bizarre turn of Maoist world strategy and Chinese foreign policy. The main enemy in greater danger was no longer the world imperialism centered in the United States, but Soviet social imperialism. Thus, when US-backed Augusto Pinochet overthrew the Chilean government of Salvador Allende in 1973, China immediately recognized Pinochet and hailed the coup. When the South African troops invaded Angola in 1975 after Angolan independence under the pro-Soviet MPLA, China backed South Africa. During the Portuguese Revolution of 1974-75, to the Maoist forces there reached out to the far right. Maoist currents throughout Western Europe called for the strengthening of NATO against the Soviet threat. China supported Philippine dictator Fernando Marcos in his attempt to crush the Maoist guerrilla movements in that country. Maoism had had a certain serious impact on new left forces in the West in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Unraveling the factional differences among these groups would take us too far afield, 
and most of them had faded away by the 1980s. By Maoism, as, in, as interpreted in different ways, but Maoism, as interpreted in different ways, was important in Germany, Italy, France, and the United States. Some groups, such as the ultra-Stalinist Progressive Labour Party in the United States, saw the writing on the wall as early as 1969 and broke with China in that year. Most of these groups were characterized by Stalinist thuggery against opponents, and occasionally among themselves. Their influence was as diffuse as it was pernicious. CA 1975, there were hundreds of Marxist-Leninist study groups around the United States, and hundreds of cadre had entered the factories to organize the working class. By the mid-1970s, three main Maoist groups had emerged as dominant in the U.S. left. The Revolutionary Union, RU, and under Bob Avakian, later named the RCP, <laughs> the October League, OL, under Mike, Mike Klonsky, and the Communist Labour Party, CLP. To really understand some of the differences between them, one needed to know their relationship to the old revisionist Communist Party USA. The more moderate groups, such as the October League, hearkened back to Earl Browder's leadership during the popular front years. More hardline groups, such as the CLP, looked to the more openly Stalinist William Z. Foster. These and other smaller groups fought ideological battles over the proper attitude to take toward Enver Hoxha's Albania, which for some, after China's pro-US turn, remained for them the sole truly Marxist-Leninist country in the world. One small group trumpeted the three threes, third international, third period, third world. In Germany, new left Maoism was on the ascendant after 1968, a process which it gingerly termed the positive overcoming of the anti-authoritarian movement of that year. A major current was the KPD, which fought against the much larger DKP. <clears throat> Out of the KPD came a multitude of smaller K-Gruppen with poetic names such as KPDML, wrote Heimat, Red Homeland, with distinct populist overtone, overtones of soil. Only the DKP had any influence in the working class with its infiltration of the trade unions. It was content to sit back after 1972 when the Social Democratic government of Willy Brandt issued its radical decree and came down hard on the K-Gruppen, which as the Italian Communist, much as the Italian Communist Party, PCI, with 25% of the vote in the 1976 elections not only sat back while the Italian government criminalized the entire far left as terrorists, it actively helped the government in the suppression of the far left after the Red Brigades kidnapped and executed the right-wing politician Aldo Moro in spring 1978, as he was on his way to sign the historical compromise, which would have allowed the PCI to join the Christian Democrats in a grand coalition. In France, Maoism never had the clout of the much larger main Trotskyist parties, Lutte Ouvrière, the Ligue Communiste Révolutionnaire, and the latter two cases under different names. Oh, fuck. And the Organisation Communiste Internationaliste, all of which are still around today, in the latter two cases under different names. Most of the Maoist Marxist-Leninist groups had been discredited by their manipulative role during the May-June 1968 general strike, such as one which marched to the barricades on the night of the most serious street fighting, pitting thousands of people against thousands of cops, announced that the whole thing was a government provocation, and urged everyone to go home, as they themselves proceeded to do. But in the spring of 1970, one small ultra-Stalinist and ultra-militant Maoist group, the gauche proletar proletarian, proletarian left, momentarily recruited Jean-Paul Sautry to its defense when the government banned it, following some spectacular militant interventions around the country. Sartre, who had, over the previous 20 years, been successively pro-Soviet, pro-Cuba, and then pro-China, saved the GP from extinction, 
but it collapsed of its own ideological frenzy shortly thereafter. It notably produced two particularly cretinous or cretinous neoliberal ideologues after 1977, Bernard Henry Levi and Andre Glucksmann, as well as Serge July, editor in chief of the now very respectable Daily Liberation, which began as the newspaper of the GP. Oh, fuck. Former French Maoists turned up in the strangest places, such as Roland Castro, a fire-eating Maoist in 1968, who became an intimate of socialist President François Mitterland and was appointed to a leading technocratic position. Maoism, Maoism in Britain again had next to no influence, whereas both the Trotskyist Socialist Labour League, SLL, and the IS, leader w, or SWP, at their 1970s peaks, had thousands of members and a serious presence in the working class. In Japan, finally, the most advanced capitalist country in Asia, Maoism, as in Britain and in, and in France, had no chance against the large, sophisticated new left groups in the militant Zeng Zengakuren, which not only had no time for Maoism, but not even for Trotskyism, and which characterized both the Soviet Union and China as state capitalist. Only the small underground pro-North Korean Red Army could in any way have been characterized as Maoist. In 1976, as mentioned earlier, the Maoist Gang of Four, who up to Mao's death had been at the pin pinnacle of state power, were arrested, jailed, and never heard from again, as the revisionists headed by Deng Xiaoping returned to power and prepared to launch China on the road to market socialism, or socialism with Chinese characteristics beginning in 1978. This bizarre ideological period finally ended in 1978-79 when China, now firmly an ally of the United States, attacked Vietnam and was rudely pu pushed back by the Vietnamese army under General Giap of Dien Bien Phu fame. Vietnam, still allied with the Soviet Union, had occupied Cambodia to oust the pro-Maoist Khmer Rouge, who had taken over the country in 1975, and who went on to kill upward of one million people. In response to China's attack on Vietnam, the Soviet Union threatened to attack China. For any remaining Western Maoists at this point, the consternation was palpable. As elsewhere in different forms, the Maoists in the United States did not go quietly into that dark night. Many of those who went into industry or otherwise colonized working class communities rose to positions of influence in the trade union bureaucracy, such as Bill Fletcher of the Freedom Road Group, who was briefly a top aide to John Sweeney when the leader took over the AFL-CIO in 1955, or 1995. Mike Klonsky of the October League traveled to China in 1976 to be anointed as the official liaison to the Chinese regime after the fall of the Gang of Four, but that did not prevent the OL from fading away. The RCP sent colonizers to West Virginia mining towns where they were involved in some wildcat strikes. Some of those strikes, however, were against teaching Darwin in the schools. The RCP also supported ROAR, the racist anti-busing coalition, during the crisis in Boston in 1975. Bob Avakian, in 1978, with four other RCP members, rushed the podium when Deng Xiaoping appeared at a press conference in Washington with Jimmy Carter to consummate the U.S.-China alliance. They were charged with multiple felonies, and Avakian remains in exile in Paris to this day. In 1984 and 1988, Maoists of different stripes were deeply involved in Jesse Jackson's run for the presidency giving rise in 1984 after Jackson lost out, due, lost out to the Marxist-Leninists for Mondal phenomenon. Members of the Communist Workers' Party, CWP, suffered a worse fate when in 1979, members of the Ku Klux Klan in North Carolina, where they had organized in several textile towns, fired on their rally, killing five of them. But during Occupy Oakland in the fall of 2011, it emerged that no less than Oakland Mayor Jean Kwan, as well as some of her key advisors, 
and high-level members of the Alam Alameda County Labor Council were former members of the self-same CWP. More recently, former members of the RCP who had their fill of Avakian's cult of personality formed the Casma Network, which now has a much larger, if more diffuse, influence, at least on the internet. On a world scale, Maoists recently joined a coalition government in Nepal and various groups, some reaching back to the 1960s or even earlier, continue to be active in the Philippines. The Indian Naxalites, who were stone Maoists in, their, in the 1970s before they were crushed by Indira Gandhi, have made something of a comeback in poor rural areas. The Shining Path Group in Peru, which was similarly crushed by Fujimori, has made a steady comeback there, openly referring to such groups as the Cambodian Khmer Rouge as a model. To conclude, it is important to consider the post-1978 fate of Maoism in China itself. For the regime, which since 1978 has overseen nearly 35 years of virtually uninterrupted and unprecedented economic growth, averaging close to 10% per year over decades, with the methods of market socialism, Mao Zedong remains an indispensable icon of the ruling ideology. In officialese, Mao was 70% right and 30% wrong. The wrong part usually means the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, although serious discussion and research on those events remains largely, if not wholly, taboo. As a result, a rose-tinted nostalgic view of Maoism and the Cultural Revolution has become de rigueur in the so-called Chinese New Left. There have even been echoes of Maoism in the recent fall of top-level bureaucrat Bo Zilei, former strongman of Chongqing, with a decidedly populist style which led some of his opponents to warn of the dangers of a new cultural revolution. Given the impossibility in China of frank public discussion of the entirety of Mao's years in power and before, and the small fragments of information available to the young generations about those years, it is hardly surprising that currents opposing the appalling spread of social inequality and insecurity since 1978 would turn back to that mythical past. This hardly makes such a turn less reactionary and dangerous. Everything that happened after 1978 had its origins in the nature of the regime before 1978. There was no counter-revolution, still less a transformation of the previously existing social relations of production. Once again, Maoism reveals its highly idealist and voluntarist conception of politics by a focus on the ideology of top leaders, as it previously did with Khrushchev's 1956 speech and thaw. China from 1949 to 1978 was preparing the China of 1978 to the present. Even those pointing to the shattering of the iron rice bowl, the number one ideological underpinning of the old regime, ignore the practice of significant casualized labor in the industrial centers in the 1950s and 1960s. Until a true new left in China seriously rethinks the place of Maoism in the larger context of the history of the Marxist movement, and particularly its origins in Stalinism and not in the true defeated world proletarian moment of 1917 to 1921, it is doomed to reproduce in China as in different parts of the developing world either grotesque copies of Maoism's periodic ultra-Stalinism, as in Peru, or to be the force that prepares the coming of market socialism by destroying the pre-capitalist forms of agriculture and engaging in forced, autarkic industrialization until Western or Japanese and Korean, or why not, Chinese capital arrives to allow the full emergence of capitalism.